for the next 45 minutes, you're going to get a glimpse of a small band of pirates trying to do epic shit. A small band of pirates in a very fast boat. Welcome to ATAP. Here, we don't tinker. We build new things, sometimes seemingly impossible things. We are optimized for speed. It is an essential characteristic of our work. Our small internal team is connected to hundreds of external teams. It's how we tackle hard problems at the intersection of high-end, push-to-the-edge hardware and software, at the intersection of tech and art, science and application, problems you can't solve by yourself. And it's how we do so without compromising the tech or the beauty or a sense of soul. We have protectors of all of these elements with us. There are 11 projects ongoing at present in ATAP and partners all around them. This is the global web of our partners. We believe this yields better solutions and faster. In the last two years, we have worked with 305 partners in 22 countries on three continents. Universities, startups, large system integrators, governments, and nonprofits. The answer is out there, somewhere, if we are just humble enough to find it. This approach also lets us do large-scale research and ship, both. We dare to dream and do. ATAP is full of doer dreamers like many of you. And our goal is to close the gap between what if and what is. We're going to talk a lot of tech this morning. We'll talk about three out of the 11 projects currently ongoing in ATAP. Three projects in 45 minutes. They are proof points. Johnny Lee, Paul Aramenko, and Rashid El Garab lead these projects. They are ATAP technical project leads. They come for two years. No one comes to build a career in ATAP. You come to build something, to do your best work. We're going to start off with Johnny, interface technology expert, core contributor to Connect, a top-rated TED Talk using Wiimotes, now Project Tango lead, trying to make the future awesome, and a tablet that sees in 3D. Paul will be up next. Evangelist for the power of open, complexity geek, drone designer, rocket scientist, and occasional pilot, MIT, Caltech, Georgetown, currently head of Project Aura. And a guest appearance from Glenn Keane, animator, storyteller, and champion of the hand-drawn line, Disney legend, creator of beloved characters from Ariel to Aladdin, and now ATAP upcoming Spotlight Story duet. Johnny, the floor is yours. <laughs> wow, all right. Uh, wow, thanks. thanks for that warm welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you guys about Project Tango. So Project Tango is an effort that we've been pushing on to try to give devices a human scale understanding of space and motion. Each of us do something remarkable every day. You sitting in your seat roughly understand the size of this room, as well as the position and orientation of the person sitting next to you, as well as yourself. And this sense of spatial awareness is remarkable, yet we take it for granted every day, because it's our human perception system that does this just for free. But our phones, our tablets, and our laptops have no understanding of this spatial relationship, yet it's so fundamental to the way we interact with each other, as well as the way we interact with things. So what if you had this in a device? What could you do? Well, imagine if the directions to your destination didn't stop just at the front door, but could actually take you to the exact room that you wanted to get to, or it could allow the visually impaired navigate spaces that they've never been in before. You could play games in your house where you use the furniture as you know, castles, or you play hide and seek with game characters who actually know where your closet is and can go hide there. 
Um, you could also en enable emerging applications, such as robotics, such as allowing free-flying robots to navigate through the space station, which is, we have one of our Project Tango devices going up in August into the ISS. Now, the reason we think we can do this now is because if you look at the amount of computing power available on mobile processors, it has grown exponentially, as was everything else. Uh, this is a very common Moore's Law chart I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, with some example mobile processors. And today we have processors like the Tegra K1 with a tremendous amount of computing power. But what's really interesting is if you plot another device on this chart, which is the uh, vehicle that won the 2005 DARPA Grand Challenge. So the modern processors we have and that we can buy today actually exceed the amount of compute necessary to drive 132 miles autonomously through the Mojave Desert. So the compute is here. The compute is genuinely here to do amazing things with our devices. What's missing is the hardware and software. So Project Tango is a focused effort to work with the hardware and software ecosystem to advance the state of 3D sensing on mobile, on mobile hardware. As Regina mentioned, well, the way ATOP operates, we work with a very large network of partners. Uh, we work with device manufacturing, engineering support, processor vendors, uh, IMU, gyro and accelerometer vendors, lenses, camera sensors, depth sensors, optics, partners within Google, computer vision companies, and universities, all spanning nine countries around the world. So let me give you a quick tour of our hardware journey up to where we've been to today. So we've actually built four platforms over the past 18 months. Each of these were built to answer a very specific question, uh, and I'll just walk through them quickly. Uh, first, we built a USB peripheral with commodity parts, commodity cameras, commodity sensors, and this was to ask, can we actually run these decades of robotics and computer vision algorithms on consumer-grade hardware? And the answer was yes, we can. The second prototype was a tablet we built in three months, and the question was to ask, can we actually run all these algorithms on a mobile processor? And the answer was also yes. The phone prototype we talked about earlier this year um, was our effort to reduce the size of the lenses and the cameras to respect the, uh, the form factor requirements to fit in a modern phone or tablet, which is things like the six millimeter Z height for the sensors. And indeed, these devices also did work. Now we have the culmination of the work of everyone within our network over the past 18 months to bring us to this. This is our current prototype, our dev kit that we will be making available next year. And we built this device from the ground up to do 3D and from the ground up to four compute. It has our high performance four megapixel, two micron camera. This is a very high speed light sensitive sensor. We have our customized motion tracking camera that allows the device to understand its motion in 3D space. Uh, we've also worked with hardware vendors to force the, the improvements of the performance of these devices to fit into a device uh, to do 3D sensing that gives us geometry about the floor and the walls. And then we found the uh, one partner that was interested in building this device with us to put in the most powerful uh, processor that we could find and uh, pack it with as much RAM and storage as a laptop. So this is designed for developers to explore 3D compute. A little peek into the software side now. Um, on the left side, you'll see the fisheye image. If you think about human vision, we have this amazing peripheral vision. We are able to see far out to the sides, but we also have this area in the center that we have detail, our foveated region. And what these two cameras do is give us uh, something analogous to human vision, where we have a wide fisheye camera and a, a more traditional field of view camera as well. You'll also notice in the bottom uh, left that there's these little white dots. This is actually carefully time-stamped gyro and accelerometer data. Uh, the motion sensors in a phone is very much similar to the motion sensors you have in your inner ear. So this allows us to have both the eyes and the motion sensing capabilities of human perception. Uh, a little bit about the depth sensor. Uh, at a very simplistic level, it essentially it's a sensor that sees shape instead of color. Uh, on the left, you'll see a more traditional image taken with a camera. You can see all the color and shading and lighting of the scene. Uh, but on the right, you'll actually see this is what the depth sensor sees. It just gives us information about the contours and the shape of all the furniture, regardless of the color and to some degree independence of the lighting conditions. When we combine all the tracking data and the sensing data together, we end up being able to fuse it into a single estimate of both the device's position and the environment. Um, this is a video of uh, Joel Hesch, who's uh, one of the computer vision engineers on the team. 
You'll see on the left side, this is the raw data coming into the system, the camera, the move motion sensors in the bottom, and what we compute is what's on the right, which is the trajectory of the device in real time. So what he's doing is he's walking around the first floor of this 40,000 square foot building, and you can actually see in real time it's estimating his position throughout that space. Now because we just use the cameras and the motion sensors, this is a full 3D trajectory. It is not restricted to a single plane. Thanks. And you can actually see the sort of coil as it goes up the stairwell. Um, now remember, there's no GPS, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no Bluetooth. This is just using the cameras and the motion sensors. The only requirement that we have in the environment is we have light, which is similar to the amount of requirement that you have to walk through the space. What, what he's doing here is he's now walked across, up five flights of stairs, across this entire building, down five flights of stairs, back to his original location. Uh, and this is a very simple test for us to sort of understand how well we're doing. And it turns out that we have about 1% of drift over path dri length driven. Now when we combine the tracking information with the depth sensor, we actually are now able to capture geometry of the environment. Uh, this is Yvonne, one of the interns on the project. Uh, this is a false color image where red is low and blue is high, but you can see that it's capturing the floor, the walls, and the stairs as we walk up. In just a second, it's gonna show you this top-down view, which you can actually see that even after five flights of travel, we can still see down the middle of the stairwell. Again, the accuracy and alignment of the data is on the order of 1%. So you've probably seen scans like this with $10,000 or $100,000 laser scanners on industrial scanning, but what's new is the push to make this happen on a consumer scale device. Uh, now, scanning stairwells isn't something most people need to do. It's actually a nice test structure because it has X, Z, X, Y, N, Z variation, so we can see our accuracy along every dimension. But you can imagine once we get this into the cans of consumers, they can do things like uh, capture the geometry of their house. So this is me walking around with one of the prototypes walking around my house. Uh, again, red is the floor and blue is the walls. Um, but this is me walking around my living room, uh, laundry room, guest bathroom, uh, and other uh, bedroom. Um, I'm basically walking around my house as quickly as I would naturally walk. Um, I don't have to move particularly slowly. Um, I just sort of point it as I'm giving, as though I'm giving someone else a tour of my house. In a second, it's going to show you a zoom in of one of the uh, the rooms. You can see that the real time structure is relatively coarse, but this is already enough geometry for game developers. If someone had to make a, a game where soldiers had to like attack your bathtub, if you wanted to. <laughs> Um, but if you actually capture the data and store it, you can do much better. So this is a partner the, called Matterport where we gave one of our devices. And if you store the data and do offline processing, the quality that you can produce from these devices is much higher. <laughs> this is cool stuff, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're going to switch to the tablet to show you some real demos, some real life, uh, real time demos. Do we have our tablet? No. All right, great. On the left side, you see the fisheye lens, and you actually see these hardware accelerated uh, feature tracks. And this basically gives us the motion of the device. Um, the gyro and accelerometer data are these little waveforms underneath. Now, if I turn the tablet left and right, you see the cone swapping back and forth. But what's different is that we are actually able to track the motion. So if I move left and right, it's actually tracking my position. And if I go, if I make a big circle, it actually is tracking me in real time. So if I wasn't tethered to this cable, I could actually just unplug, actually walk through the entire Moscone Center, and it would be tracking my position in full six degree freedom continuously. Uh, now let me give you a quick example of uh, some demos that we've built uh, using this. These are all built inside of the Uni game engine. I mean, this is an extremely, extremely simple puzzle game where if I move the yellow cube and put it on the yellow switch, it makes more blocks appear. But you can see that the blue cube and the blue switch are far separated. So I actually have to move forward to hit this switch. Okay. And because I actually can't reach this blue green switch, I'm actually going to have to throw it. Okay. Yeah. 
Ah, I threw it too far. All right. There you go. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is another tech demo that we built inside of the Unity game engine. And if you imagine once you have the geometry of your house and you want to create sort of fantasy lands in different rooms, uh, you can have uh, uh, use the device just to sort of control the camera as you look around. But you can see there's this wizard on the ground, but he's only about six inches tall. So if I want to get down to his level of the world, all I have to do is squat down, okay? as if he's right in front of me. So I can look at the trees and the stones and then sort of under, interact with him directly. But if I want to interact with the main map, I just sort of stand back up and say, hey, go over, go over there. And he'll sort of walk over in that direction. Um, the other demo I want to show you is uh, something that one of our university partners uh, just got working very recently. And this combines both the depth sensing data and the tracking data together. So what's going on here is I'm actually building a 3D map of the stage in real time. Wow, here we go. Come on. We learned a lot of new things on this project, so. So I can sort of map up this wall and it'll start to texture it and capture it as I walk around. So as the hardware and software both become better, uh, this type of uh, technology will become uh, you know, part of the tools that we want to provide, but it's not there today. Uh, we're currently working actively with both uh, um, uh, companies as well as universities to improve the software stack. So can we go back to the slides? So as I mentioned, we want to do this in collaboration with both the hardware and the software uh, entities out there. Uh, we're excited to announce that we've started early engagement with LG to make a consumer scale device next year. Um, we have early integrations with both Unity and the Unreal Engine and Qualcomm Vuforia. So if you already know how to work with these tools, uh, you can build a Project Tango enabled app. I encourage you guys to go out to the sandbox area, try some of the demos. These are par uh, partners that have gotten early development units and started doing demos. And uh, there's a lot more work to do. And if you want to sign up for DevKit, go to the website or go to the sandbox. Um, there's a tremendous amount of new work to do when we start thinking about what happens when our devices have this sense of awareness. And I want to work with each of you because I genuinely think the future is awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, normally, when demos fail for Johnny, he does a little jig on stage. So we, we miss that part of it. Project Tango is one of ATAP's most mature projects. Project Aura is in an earlier stage. Both capitalize on advances in mobile computing, miniaturization, optimization of electronics, and the opportunities that result at that intersection. They are both challenging what we believe to be possible in a mobile platform. Tango and Aura have accomplished in months what would normally take years. That's not an odd coincidence. It's the result of a core belief for us, namely that open wins over closed, and that speed is essential to innovation. To give you a sense of ATAP speed, let's take a look at the last two years. Now, ATAP was born on May 22nd, 2012. We are two years, one month, and four days old today. And in that time, 11 projects have been born from acoustics to wearables. We've shipped multiple products to scale, Windy Day and Buggy Night, our first two spotlight stories, and Skip, an NFC authentication token among them. Soon, you'll be able to authenticate your Moto X with the next generation of NFC auth, a digital tattoo, that lasts for five days. We built an interdisciplinary team of 114 from statistical ethnographers to Oscar-winning directors. Our Skunk Workshop can build almost anything, and fast. We can build, cut, bend, and take things apart. On June 21st last year, we signed a multi-university research agreement with eight of the country's top universities, from Caltech to MIT, Texas to Illinois, 
and then eight turned into 16. It doesn't take us nine to 12 months to contract with researchers anymore. It takes us less than 30 days. We've had two parent companies, one lock picking class, several engagements, two weddings, and six baby pirates born. That's a fast boat. Paul is the technical lead for Project Ara, and if you want to see fast, watch Paul. Paul. Thank you, Regina. Uh, as, uh, as Regina mentioned, I am the technical project lead for Project Ara. What if we asked better questions of our phones? Like, what if a phone could see in the dark? Or what if a phone could test if water is clean? What if I could share the best parts of my phone? What if a phone could? We think that a phone should. And a modular phone platform might just make all of these things possible. There are lots of challenges, true. So much so that many have said it couldn't be done at all. But we decided to give it a shot. And in ATAP fashion, we started by turning statements like, it's impossible, into numbers. What exactly does impossible mean? Now, the principal challenge to modularity is overhead. What we found is that Moore's law, the miniaturization of electromechanical components, and a modern data protocol could get the modularity penalty at the system level down to about 25% across the board in PCB area, in device weight, and in overall power consumption. In exchange, users would have the flexibility to turn the phone into a solution to an old problem, or to turn their phone into a new possibility altogether, to turn their phone into a means of choosing. Why choose a phone for its camera when instead you could choose a camera for your phone? Why can't I slide in a module that's my key fob, then take it out, give it to a valet? Why not share the most expensive sensor or component among my friends, my family, or perhaps across a village. Think of Ara as a versatile computing platform, one where development of each element is paced by the limits of our collective imagination and the capabilities to build new amazing things. Think of it as an analog to the Android app ecosystem, just in hardware. So we assembled a team, a small technical team within ATAP, 20 partners, some 150 people across three continents. Universities, major chip makers, industrial designers, interaction engineers, many, many others. And the goal is to have the team iterate, advances in one area and form another, a process of constant trade-offs and cooperative effort to close the design across the disciplines and across the teams. If we did it linearly, it would take us a decade. Instead, Let's boot it. nine months into the project, we have our first functional form factor prototype. There is lots more to do, but we're off to a good start. This is Ara being born. Oh. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> As you see, uh, just a few short weeks ago, the phone was tethered to a laboratory bench. Since then, we have uh, cut the umbilical, and we have exercised many of its features. So I invite you to see for yourself. This is uh, the Spiral One prototype. We could switch to the shoulder cam. There you go. This is the Spiral One prototype. It uses FPGAs to implement a packet switch network on device using the industry standard MIPI Unipro protocol. It also has a flexible power bus that allows any module to be a power source, a power sink, or a power storage device. And it supports, in limited fashion for now, the hot swapping of batteries and other modules. So shall we see if we can get it to boot today? Seth. Uh, this is Seth Newberg. He's our chief electrical engineer, and uh, he's going to power it on. Here's what, here's what you should expect. Uh, about 10 seconds into, into the boot sequence, the power bus will initialize. Um, the LED, there's an LED module on the back, which Seth will show you in a bit. It'll come on. About 30 seconds into the boot sequence, if all goes well, uh, the display module should initialize, and the screen will do a, uh, will do a quick flash. About 35 seconds into the boot sequence, the Linux kernel will boot, and the Android logo will appear on the screen. And hopefully, fingers crossed, at 60 seconds, uh, the Android home screen will appear on the device. So Seth, go ahead. Uh, 
is the LED. Oh, flash. This is promising. a little bit further, just a little bit further. <laughs> Ooh. Well, we're most of the way there. <laughs> So maybe we'll let Seth, uh, we'll let Seth uh, uh, power cycle it and uh, try again. I assume we can't recover from that particular screen without a power, power reboot. Uh, in the meantime, let's go back, back to slides. Uh, Patrick, you can relax for a second. And uh, we'll call you back if we, uh, if we, reestablish, if we reestablish the home screen there. Um, so let me talk about what's difficult about this, other than actually getting the phone to boot. Uh, there are many technical challenges that must be overcome, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, just a few of them. Um, I'd like to talk about antenna design, about the interconnects uh, that go into, into making the device work, uh, about a software architecture that, uh, that supports modularity at the device level, and uh, making it beautiful, the industrial design and the aesthetics of the device, which, which may actually be one of the hardest challenges uh, of all. So, Cellular and Wi-Fi antennas in a user-configurable modular device pose a, a, a particularly unique challenge. Our approach has been to use uh, computer-optimized computer conductive grid antennas developed by one of our partners, X5 Systems, and to leverage the endoskeleton frame's uh, metallic structure as part of the antenna, as part of the antenna system. Uh, we're also experimenting with 3D printing the antenna using conductive inks as part of the module shells. Now, to reduce the modularity overhead, we decided on a contactless approach to the data interconnections between the modules and the endoskeleton. Uh, this allows us to save precious volume and PCB area, uh, but capacitive or inductive data transmission mechanisms are lossy, and minimizing insertion loss across a range of frequencies is, uh, is hard. Uh, interestingly, the challenge is actually not at the high frequencies, uh, but rather efficiently supporting the transmission of low bitrate data at the low power gears uh, of the data protocol. How are we doing there, Seth? No luck yet, okay. Um, the uh, electropermanent magnets uh, uh, alleviate the need for mechanical connectors or latches in attaching the module to the endoskeleton frame. EPMs are magnets that are passive in both the off state and the on state and take a short current pulse in order to switch between those two states. EPMs are a proven technology that's been used in industrial lift and crane applications and they've been around for decades. For Project Aura, we had to miniaturize them by a factor of 1,000 from something that can lift a car to something that can hold the weight of a small kitten. <laughs> the current prototype platform um, relies on custom kernel drivers for each module. This approach is neither scalable nor secure, given an open ecosystem of third-party developers as we envisage. Um, the network stack, as I mentioned, employs the MIPI Unipro protocol. In future spirals of the platform, slated for later this year and early next calendar year, the Android kernel will utilize generic class drivers for Unipro with user space components for any additional functionality or for non-class conforming devices. Yes, this is going to require changes to Android to make it modular and to support hardware hot plug. In this regard, R is a stress test to see what Android can do in applications that stretch beyond the traditional smartphone. Now, let's talk power for a second. Battery technology has been advancing rapidly, just not so much in smartphones. Today, the tech is here to make a battery with triple the energy density of a conventional cell phone battery. An example is the silicon lithium ion layer technology. But the battery will have reduced cycle life. Modularity opens up new opportunities for innovation and getting it to market quickly. And the user can choose the technology based on their specific need or use case. So such a battery would more than make up for the increased power consumption of a modular architecture. But if you don't want a new battery, you can hot swap a regular battery module to essentially get any battery life that you want. Now, putting all of this together, 
We sought an industrial design that can be both modular and beautiful. It must overcome the connotations of boxiness and brick-like that people associate with modularity. And it also has to close from an electrical and functional perspectives. With our industrial design partner, New Deal Design, we strive for smooth, sleek-looking modules without traditional connectors and a parceling scheme that celebrates rather than conceals the modularity of the device as well as aesthetic customization to give users the expressive capability well beyond simply selecting the color of their phone. To that end, we're working with our partners to develop a new production 3D printer that operates at 50 times the speed of existing 3D printing technology. It will yield, it will yield full 600 DPI color in hard, soft, and conductive materials. We're after strength and surface finish comparable to that of consumer-grade plastics, except, of course, the color, shape, and texture can be entirely unique from user to user and from module shell to module shell. OK, enough about the challenges. Let me show you what is under the hood, what goes into an R module. So this is a close-up of a Wi-Fi module. Um, it has spring pins for now uh, in the Spiral 1 prototype in, in place of the contactless pads that I, that I talked about. It has two electropermanent magnets to support the insertion of the module either in, in landscape or portrait orientation. Uh, there are a number of discrete components that you see up there uh, for, for power management and for driving the electropermanent magnets. These will be replaced with an integrated PMIC, or power management integrated circuit. Uh, there is currently a rather large FPGA that serves as our Unipro network processor. It will be replaced with a Unipro bridge ASIC in the next couple of months. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, depicted here is the Wi-Fi baseband processor and an antenna connector in the upper right-hand corner uh, of the slide. In this first spiral, about 65 to 70 percent of the module is consumed by modular overhead, uh, things you wouldn't have in a regular smartphone, in other words. That leaves about 30 to 35 percent of the module for developer unique functionality. By October, we expect to have our Spiral 2 platform and prototype built around custom ASICs for the Unipro network processing. This will bring the usable area for module developers to somewhere around 70 or 75% of the module area. And while doing exact silicon area estimates is uh, kind of a challenge, uh, in the long run, we expect that native adoption of Unipro across a wide range of peripherals will get the modularity overhead down to approximately 10 to 15% of each individual module's PCB area. In the meantime, however, we think that there are a lot of interesting things that can be done even on the current ARA platform. And so today, I'm pleased to announce the first in a series of price challenges for ARA module developers. We will award $100,000 to the developer of a, of a novel module aimed at daily use that enables something that you cannot currently do with a smartphone. We encourage teams, and the module must be working when it is submitted to us for judging. The first two runners-up will get all expense paid trips to the next ARA developer event in the fall. We're making a set of developer hardware available to price challenge participants, along with the latest release of our Module Developers Kit, or MDK. Guys, this will be really hard, but we're going to do this together. We're making a supply chain for EPMs. We're, in the we're developing the processes needed for shell fabrication. The Unipro ASICs are well on their way. Expect a prototype version of Android with modularity feature support sometime in the fall. And the MDK is already out. Download it, check it out. So if we were to ask better questions of our phone, maybe they would look something like this. Oh, it just booted. No, I'm kidding. Okay. 
If there's anything I've learned over time, it's that stories move us. In his book entitled The Golden Theme, Brian McDonald wrote about the universal truth of storytelling. He argues that there is one golden theme in stories, from westerns to science fiction, myths to fairy tales. That truth is all any story worth telling is getting at. And in this regard, he says, he believes he has discovered the single underlying truth that links all stories. We are all the same. Spotlight Stories is about finding the age-old truth of storytelling in modern technology. On October 29th last year, Moto X users got a little gift, a red hat that danced across their screen. The red hat marked an entry to a portal, a portal to an interactive, immersive world, where a mouse named Pepe learned that coveting a red hat is dangerous business. And users started smiling at their phones in new ways. Windy Day was the first of ATAP Spotlight Stories, a new storytelling format made uniquely for mobile. It is at the intersection of hardware, software, and content, art, and technology. Today's smartphones have graphics processing capabilities equal to game consoles. So we asked, what could we do with all that power? This industry spends billions every year making the tasks of our lives more efficient. But what about the entire emotional landscape of our lives? If you want to do something that touches people emotionally, you go running to storytelling. Perhaps in the advances of mobile, we might find a new creative canvas for storytelling. So we asked the best to help us find out. Oscar-winning director Jan Pinkova, Oscar-winning producer producer Karen Dufalo, the artist who animated Woody in Toy Story, Doug Sweetland, character animator Mark Oftedal, art director and Caldecott medal winner, John Klassen. Animators, modelers, and sound experts from eight different countries descended on ATAP. They joined our technical team, and they started to build. What together they delivered was a simple story, a narrative with a beginning, middle, and end, where your phone is not a small screen at all, but a window to a new world. Windy Day is a technical feat. It is rendered in real time at 60 frames per second. Indeed, it is the first ever real-time rendering implementation of Pixar's open graphics standard, Open Subdiv, and simultaneously the first ever use on mobile. It required an intimate understanding of the graphics pipeline, from the GPU to the OS, through scheduling, all the way to the high-level rendering engine, and a rethinking of tessellation to fit to the hardware requirements of real time. And it required hardware engineers, those intimately familiar with GPUs and IMUs, because the IMU sensor data is what told us where you were looking in the story so we'd know what to render. And if the phone was to feel like a window, invisible, the sensor fusion performance had to improve. So we implemented precision planetary landing algorithms to make the interaction fluid. We are building a story development kit that will enable new stories to be written. One day, we hope, you'll have a new type of film festival a film festival in your pocket. And our second story turned the forest of Windy Day into a buggy night. And we continued our conversation with artists. We have this new format. What would you do with it? And one of those conversations was with Glenn Keane. Glenn Keane is a legendary animator, a singularity on this planet. He was with Disney for 38 years. Glenn wanted to draw again, but with a graphite pencil. That meant that he was to become our rendering engine. Only he'd render on paper 
and in 2D. Now, Glenn is at once an amazing rendering engine, but he's very high latency. <laughs> he just can't draw in real time on the screen. Glenn's art challenged the tech of Spotlight Stories in entirely new ways. And the Spotlight Stories studio became a place where animators and engineers sat side by side, where Glenn taught us to draw, and we taught him if then else. <laughs> now, he flipped a few things on us, too. He turned the rendering timing problem completely upside down. In CG, the time of the frame is chosen, and the rendering engine creates a perfectly tuned image. But because Glenn was our engine, all animation timing had to be cued off the image drawn. There's no interpolation between hand-drawn images. This required better than 16 millisecond timing accuracy. Every piece of the pipeline had to become high precision. It took three months to implement an entirely new timing architecture. Everything from the animation system to the camera had to behave in reverse order. And when it's wrong, it's wrong. Ghosting occurs, or characters miss their cues. We flipped a few problems on Glenn. Traditional animation is drawn at 24 frames per second. But on a mobile device, everything is waiting for frames at 60 frames per second. That meant that Glenn had to draw not in 24 frames per second, but in 60 frames per second. And he had to draw in three-point perspective at scale. Glenn's story duet contains 10,055 original drawings. And these are just the frames that are visible. Many more were not used. So we had to develop a filing system. This is Glenn's. <laughs> and this is ours. And we had to recover occasionally from file corruption. <laughs> Compression became critically important. Glenn is able to create seamless transitions, like the transformation of characters as they grow. In fact, it's so seamless, you don't feel there's anything unnatural about it. No technique in CG will allow that to happen. No mathematical encoding will enable you to do such a transformation. That meant what was once a mathematical representation of the line now was a graphite stardust field. And each drawing had to be mapped exactly to the screen resolution so that it feels as if the line is drawn right in front of you. Pixelization destroys the life of the line. 10,055 drawings became 13.5 gigabytes of data. And we used an entire hierarchy of compression to fit that into 150 megabytes. The score attracted two Stradivarius violins and top musicians who came because the visual demanded music of equal beauty. Duet allowed state-of-the-art technology software and hardware engineers to breathe new life into an art form almost lost to us. The art of hand-drawn animations, Glenn Keane's art. I see myself as an artist first who animates. Fortunately for me, everything I've animated has always tested me to learn something new. And I, I do believe that those feelings come out in line. In embracing this new technology, I feel like I rediscovered a love for animation. As a tech team, we had no idea how this would be executed, none whatsoever. Going from CG, how do we do that? 
in a way that doesn't distort what Glenn is drawing. In CG, if something goes wrong, it's very easy to fix it up and go. In hand-drawn, there's no way, because that has to be redrawn by Glenn. To some extent, he's our rendering engine. He's the guy who's actually producing the frames. We're just putting them in a 3D space. Unlike traditional film, our hardware runs at 60 frames per second, not 24. We decided from the beginning that what you see on screen will be Glenn's drawings untouched. I've spent 40 years thinking at 24 frames a second. How in the world can I actually animate at a whole different time rate? And it was like, whoa, that's a lot of work. But then I started thinking, wait a second, this gives you 60 more possible images to describe an action with. Why wouldn't you want that? This whole experience has shown me that whether you're holding a pencil or you're programming on a keyboard, you are an artist. It's going to take both sides to really move this art form forward to what it can become. With a traditional story, the director holds the camera, so you know he'll get it right. But in our medium, we never knew. You see somebody watching duet and tearing up. That's a moment that you don't forget. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn King. Thank you. So I'm an animator, which is an actor with a pencil. Um, so I think I better boot up my device here. <laughs> Wait for it. Uh, there it goes. Okay. So like I said, I'm an, an actor with a pencil. And so whether I'm animating a mermaid or the beast or Aladdin or Tarzan, I live in the skin of the characters that I draw. In this case, it's, it's a little baby girl, which is weird, I know. <laughs> But I know, what, I know what it feels like to hold a little baby like this in your arms. Just this last week, uh, we had our new little granddaughter born. And I know that those soft little chubby arms with their little marshmallow hands, what that feels like. And when I draw, I see my drawing as a sort of... Um, it's a way for me to connect to you. Um, I see drawing as a, as a kind of seismograph of the soul. Uh, the lines representing how I feel. And kind of like um, the eyes are the window to the soul. And this is little Mia from Duet with their little beauty mark and a belly button. <laughs> Thank you. About a year ago, Regina invited me up to ATAP, and she handed me this mobile device and said, uh, so what would you do with this? And I looked at it and said, well, the screen is a lot smaller. I'm used to a big movie screen where my animation can, pl can play up there. And then I noticed it wasn't a screen at all, but it was a window into an infinite virtual world where the viewer had the camera in their hands, and it was a a seamless storytelling. It was, it was like there was no cuts in it at all. Uh, it, was, it was like unbroken eye contact, a, a captivating conversation between the artist and the viewer. I th this is wonderful. I said, so Regina, I mean, what, what do you want me to do with this? And she said, I just want you to make something beautiful 
and emotional. Wow, this is music to the ears of any artist. So what's the catch? She said, well, there is no catch. I just want you to push yourself creatively. That will push us technologically. I like this Regina. <laughs> <laughs> like, so a year later, here we are with Duet. And the thing I realize, as I think back on that year, working side by side with Rashid's team, is that whether you're an artist with a pencil, expressing yourself creatively, or you are programming on a keyboard, that kind of an artist, we stand on one another's shoulders to reach higher than any one of us could do alone. Later on this year, you'll see Duet in all of its virtual uh, interactive glory. But this morning, we're going to present it to you uh, in a theatrical format. And I hope you like it. Here's Duet. myself what I'd like you to remember about ATAP. We're a small band of pirates trying to do epic shit. 
We're trying to close the gap between what if and what is, that we are mobile first, lean and agile, open, optimized for speed. Yes, all of those things. But what I'd like for you to remember in the end, most of all, is that ATAP is full of doer dreamers like you who dare to believe, even when it means we might fail. It's terrifying and hard because it's authentic and human and scary to dare and dream and do. But it's the only thing that really matters. It's why I'm here, and I suspect it's why you're here. And I don't mean here at I.O. I mean here. It's why we're all here, to believe and dream and do. In this respect, I'm certain we are all the same. Thank you.